Oh, it's so many. Rochester Art Center artist talk for the Creative Confinement exhibition. It's called Creative Confine Confinement Art Under Quarantine. And we're very excited today to be joined by Adam Rosby and Coco Laney of Whole House Held and Leslie Barlow, um, the well-respected Minneapolis portrait painter is with us today as well. Um, we're um, going to be able to hear from them about the way that they made the work that is in the exhibition. Um, and I think today of all days as Minnesota is facing another lockdown starting Saturday morning, we are um, really needing to talk about the ways that we coped the first time around. So <laughs> I think this is really well timed uh, for all of us to uh, see the um, importance of the work that these artists were able to produce during a time um, when many of the artists could not go to their studios, when we were really not able to leave our houses very much at all. And so um, I think it's a perfect time to revisit these works right now. Um, so I'm Sheila Dickinson. I'm the artistic director at the Rochester Art Center and the curator of this exhibition. Um, I want to remind you that today in Minnesota, it is called Give to the Max Day. And this is an opportunity for many nonprofits and arts organizations to reach out to their, um, to their members and to the wider community to remember to give to the max in this time of Thanksgiving and this time of appreciating the work of many organizations in our community. Um, so Amy, who is uh, Amy Gerritsen, who is part of our tech support here at Rochester Arts Center is putting a link in the chat if you'd like to contribute today, so thank you. Um, I uh, want to say that this is part of a series. So we first had a talk with Arika Rowe and Peter Shazalski, who are two artists as part of this exhibition. And then we will be also having a subsequent um, artist talk with Zoe Chanel and um, uh, Bernadetta, Oh my gosh, I'm forgetting her last name. That's very sad. I will get it later, but that is on December 6th. So please, uh, please join us again for, for that talk. Um, so I know that not all of you have been able to see the exhibition, although I do see um, and appreciate um, friends of the Art Center that are on this call who um, have been uh, able to see it, especially Arika Rowe is here in the audience, one of the artists. So thank you for being here. I'm going to show some installation shots and just do a brief overview of, um, of the exhibition for those who were unable to see it. Uh, and then that will get us into seeing um, and hearing from more from the artists who are here today. Um, so this, uh, um, this section, exhibition came together very quickly um, and in the sense that we felt that it was a really important idea to uh, respond to the current moment. We had an opening in our schedule um, because we were closed for four months. And so we, um, we just suddenly had this opening. And so we decided uh, to look through what was happening and what artists were producing um, during their confinement. Um, so that's really where the, the title came from. And um, so I wanna kind of give a special thanks to Maggie Pemberton, who is our designer who created this really cool graphic for this and helped me design the space. Um, it really, it opens with uh, Leslie Barlow's work, who is here today. Um, and these are 20 portraits of um, friends and important people to Leslie, and she will talk more about it then. Um, but we, just to say for this exhibition, we chose to paint a, a rectangle pretty much the size of a laptop and sort of, um, uh, what do you, would you call it, sort of um, imitate or mimic a Zoom call. Um, and we know that we all, as Leslie just shared with us, she's been on Zoom calls for much of the morning, have known that this is how we're interacting with so many people. And so I 
I chose um, Leslie's work. Um, I had been, you know, following her work for many years. <laughs> I'm always, I've been a big fan, but I, um, I felt that what it captured was the gaze that we're so accustomed to now in Zoom calls that it's just a little bit off. Um, it's not directly looking at the viewer. Um, and, I, and it just uh, really is something that I think is, is really kind of disturbing when you really want to be connecting with someone, but you can't look them in the eyes. And I just thought the way that she captured that um, really spoke to me and, and, and how that um, experience was when you really want to be with somebody. Um, but also, uh, I think there's a blue sheen to each of them. Also, that kind of like electric blue, the coldness of it is also in each of these. Um, so uh, with, with this project, I know she just um, completed it at 20 and, and, and ceased doing it, but that typically Leslie works in a far larger, um, far larger space and frame. She uh, does large portraits of people um, and that these were cut to the size of her laptop screen um, so that they're much more intimate as well in that process. Um, so, uh, and we will talk more about these. So I've tried to just do a brief overview. And then as we look down this sort of long, uh, it's a very long wall, about 100 feet, <laughs> we have the introduction to Coco and Adam's work. Um, so with this, we have 12 of the portraits from Whole House Held, three separate words. Um, and in this, we have the um, images of the portraits that they did of neighbors they were just getting to know of um, uh, people who responded to social media responses and ways in which they um, were seeking to find out what and how people were responding to their quarantine um, and in fact and then asking them to produce a um, these comfort papers this is, which is what we're calling them. Um, and so we have the, most of them are the originals sent from England and from, um, and from uh, Huntsville, Alabama uh, to, their, to the Art Center. Um, and these are um, items in which um, I'm gonna, I just realized my image isn't gonna show me a close up, but we'll be able to do that in a minute. So um, these are, the questions that Adam and Coco asked was during this time, what has brought you comfort and allowed the, the um, residents in the home to just say and do whatever they wanted on one sheet of paper. And it's really fun to see how they're responding and very meaningful in that process. Um, in the exhibition, then we have a video screening room and there are two artworks in this space. Um, there's one by Zoe uh, Chanel and uh, that is um, a symphony in seven. And so this is a, uh, a video of these walks that Zoe did with her parents in Italy. They had been in lockdown um, for a long time. And so as a way to reconnect on their first day that they were able to leave their home, they were able um, to do seven walks for seven nights at 7 p.m., 7 p.m. being Italy's time. And in that process, um, there's this embodied way of connecting over time and space um, rather than, you know, in a more sort of visual way. Um, and then she had a composer compose seven tones that match the, the movements on the map of their respective places, um, St. Paul, Minnesota and um, uh, Florence, Italy, where her parents are. Um, we have another Italian artist um, in this exhibition, which is um, Bernadetta, and she um, is part of a, and created a choir called Confusion, and this choir is to incorporate and bring in um, new immigrants um, from the, uh, that are coming um, over the Mediterranean and incorporate them into uh, acquire the crosses boundary through music that, um, and in this particular one, that does not have, um, you know, is not language based. So it's sort of a duop that they're singing together. And when we found this, um, I will say that 
people were doing it that much. I mean, now we're seeing so many orchestras and bands and whatnot um, make music together over Zoom. And in this now, they are, um, um, but it's still, it's, it's well composed and very beautiful and very uh, uplifting. Um, and then at the, um, after the 12 images of um, uh, Coco and Adam's whole house held um, our, um, a large wall of Peter Szalski's labor camp report um, posters. Um, so there are 80 in total in this um, particular exhibition. They are printed directly onto um, Okay, more images of this. I'm just trying to give people an idea. Oh, that's a nice image of the um, comfort papers as well. Uh, so labor camp report began on March 24th, the day of the, the first time Minnesota went into lockdown. Uh, this um, is done by um, a, a Polish artist who is based in Minneapolis. And when he um, was an art student, um, he was in Poland and he started, studied poster design. So he didn't know really how to respond to his confinement. Um, so he began making a poster on the very first day. Um, and, and these are hand-drawn posters. Um, uh, originally, they are originals and they're more about like 11 by 17. Um, and then we printed them on 12 by 30, sorry, 24 by 36 newsprint and directly we pasted them onto the wall. And in this, they are um, responding to every day of what he is experiencing. So he spends um, at least four hours a day uh, hand drawing these. These are um, ink on paper. And don't know why that's happening, um, but uh, I can maybe scroll in uh, a little bit. Uh, but they are, um, it, once you see them individually, you can see that they are definitely responding to different moments in the, um, in the pandemic that we are now kind of familiar with and whatnot. Um, I think notably uh, the, the, um, the series begins to change uh, on um, May 25th uh, in Minneapolis, where the artist is based, is when the uh, protests began. And he begins sort of responding to that in, in the bulk of it. And so, um, uh, so with this, the attempt was to install it in a way that would make it somewhat overwhelming. Um, because I think that's how many of us are feeling in this particular moment in time by everything that's happening in our world. Um, so it also to take that sort of intimacy that I see in like Leslie and Coco and Adam's work and then kind of branch it out into this sort of the social, the political, um, that's also sort of outside of us having an impact. Um, so like uh, Coco and Adam's project, there, we, we picked 12 out of 50, right? There are many more in that project. Um, and with Peter, he, uh, this is only the first 80. He just seized this project on November 3rd, the day of the election. Um, and both these projects can be followed further on Instagram under Labor Camp. Labor Camp is the moniker for Peter Shazalski's art projects, um, and under Whole House Held for um, uh, uh, um, for Coco and Adam. The other artist um, who's here on the call is uh, um, Erika Rowe. And she's based in Mankato, Minnesota, and a photographer and bringing a sort of a, a lightness um, to our, our project, our, this exhibition. Um, so she, uh, it, in some ways, I felt there's a, a, a definitely a conversation between Whole House Held and Eureka Rose Project, because with this uh, she makes a, a rainbow day for her and her family in which they all get um, 
dressed up in different colored clothing and begin to, um, you know, just have sort of a fun day and try to, you know, make things happen in a way that is different in the monotony of our everyday life right? that had happened during the quarantine. Um, and I, I just um, kind of love the way that the family is interacting within it as well in the poses and whatnot. And Erika talks about how, you know, her daughter here in yellow is, was like, well, mom, let's make it look like we're talking, you know, let's do that. And so, um, and maybe it's kind of nice in the contrast to where we don't get inside the home with Adam and Coco's work. We're kind of in the home with Erika, with Erika's process and, and sort of what are the things they're doing in the home. Um, and then the another piece in this um, is from the, um, the stock photo project that Erika is doing in which she um, it's taking like prompts for stuff from stock photography about what people are looking for, like, you know, redesigning the home and bringing nature into the home or something, and then just like taking it a little too far, you know. And um, I just, when I saw this, I just laughed. I just can relate, just like, uh, you know, um, uh, in the sense that you know, the, it, you're just kind of going a little stir crazy. I guess that's the feeling I get from this. <laughs> you're, uh, and also just uh, potentially more and more paranoid as time goes on <laughs> uh, and wearing your mask inside and whatnot in your own home. Um, so uh, I just felt, um, again, offering a good variety. And I would definitely look up um, the further work that Erika Rowe is doing as part of this series. Um, regarding stock photography at her Instagram at Arika Row. Um, so that's it. So I just wanted, I hope I haven't taken up too much time. I just wanted to sort of contextualize um, these artists' work within the exhibition as a whole, and especially now um, that this exhibition will be closed for four weeks due to the lockdown. So therefore, just an opportunity to see what that space looks like. Um, so I think. Um, um, what I'll do is I'm going to introduce the artists and turn it over to them to kind of talk about their work. Um, so maybe what we'll do is start with Leslie because she's at the sort of beginning of the of the exhibition and as we kind of enter into it. Um, and um, so Leslie Barlow um, is a graduate of the MFA program at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design and has had um, many exhibitions throughout the country and um, she has also done work for the Vikings in Minnesota um, and she also um, has an ongoing project uh, with mixed race um, and is just a beautiful portraitist. So I'm gonna uh, turn it over to you Leslie to talk about this project or what, and your art as a whole. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, Sheila. It was nice to go through the images again because I haven't seen this show since I think it first opened. I came by in that first month. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, just really love the show. I feel like if I went through it today um, or even just a couple weeks ago, I'd feel different. You know, I'd be coming to it with a very different um, set of like just experiences since the summer was just crazy um and then moving into fall and experiencing what it's like to teach online um made me you know just experience zoom in a whole different way so um yeah uh i guess i can just start with kind of like where the ideas for this project came from um as sheila can mentioned I, can oh, i yeah. stop you for just one moment would you like to share your screen do you have better images oh. or I didn't wow. pull up any images. Um, can people see my face? Yeah, they they should be able to right now. Okay. I um, but I can stop sharing and let you share some images if you'd like. Sure. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, I can um, just give me a second to pull up my website here. Okay. Um,
Okay, can you guys see that? Yes. Awesome. Um, okay, so yeah, like I said, um, I typically paint very large, and when I mean large, I mean life size, so that um, if you were to look at one of my paintings, um, you would be looking at it kind of directly in its eye. And actually, I have some images of in or uh, installation images of other work of mine that you can see here. So just like to give you a good example here of like this person in comparison to the work um, or these ones right here. So the uh, portraits during a pandemic series. Um, did really start after about a month of um, not really sure like what I wanted to do with my own practice. Um, definitely feeling the weight of isolation um, and, and overall just feeling unmotivated. Um, something of course we're like all too familiar with right now, this feeling of um, not being able to do things as normal, right? But back then it was, we were all navigating it one day at a time. And what that looked like for me was not really being able to produce anything um, creatively. And uh, a lot of questions about, you know, what's my purpose as an artist <laughs> um, came up, uh, especially as a painter, where knowing that a lot of my art is better experienced in person, you know, there were just a lot of questions that I had about how to connect people with my work or if even that was important um, at that time. So uh, it would have been one day in April, early April, where my partner kind of brought up the fact, you know, I know you paint people, you're not really connecting with people right now. What if you just painted your Zoom calls? And so I do have to give him credit for that. It was not my idea. <laughs> um, and I was like, that actually would be kind of fun. It would, it would be easy, you know, it would be authentic because these are people that I am interacting with daily, you know, so it would feel like a natural um, thing to want to paint. Uh, and so, yeah, I basically, this first one that you see here um, of Maria, uh, was the first piece that I painted and um, what I loved about it too the process was that it, it went so quickly you know I created this painting in under two hours and that immediacy was really important for me in that moment because it felt like I had finished something <laughs> that I had accomplished something and um, my oil paintings typically take weeks if not months normally to to finish and um like a lot of folks i was experiencing that like you know energy drain there wasn't really a lot that i could focus on for long periods of time um so doing something really quick and simple like a small painting from zoom gave me a lot of energy and so i just created more and more so you can see here um, on my website uh all of the different pieces that i made um, People featured in these are friends, um, students, uh, colleagues, pretty much anybody I was have meeting with at that time. Any Zoom meeting um, or hangout, I would just screenshot it. So I actually have way more screenshots than I do paintings. Um, but I would screenshot it without their knowledge, um, of course, telling them later, but <laughs> because I didn't want the picture to feel posed. I really wanted it to feel um, as if you were, you know, as a viewer in this conversation in the moment, you know. Um, so what were the expressions that were actually um, being expressed? What was the viewing angle, um, the weird lighting of the computer, you know, all of these things I really wanted to try and capture but yeah those in-between moments um, or maybe perhaps even um, a kind of pose that they were taking not really thinking that they were being watched in that moment especially if it was a group video call 
um because i find those moments really interesting too like what are we doing on our screens when we don't think we're being watched even though we're visible um and also you know along with this it was i really wanted to kind of capture yeah how we are connecting in this moment so once i did a few um i started to think more deeply about you know in addition to getting me back into the studio and finding this joy in in um the process of painting again it was also about you know trying to document and archive the ways we are connecting in this moment a lot of my work talks about relationships connection belonging um and identity and so you know thinking about the ways that we represent ourselves you know how we dress ourselves what spaces we're in and what does that communicate um, about us through the screen um, but also that desire and that need for human connection even if you know mitigated through this um, tech barrier right um, just wanting to say something about that um and have that be documented in my own practice as someone who regularly paints people so yeah i made 20 of these and then um well actually as i was finishing up the last few me and my partner created a zine and so i'll just show you what that looks like we decided he was doing some photographs of people in our um, community uh outside of their uh inside or, or through their windows as you can see here um and then i of course had these paintings so we kind of combined them in this quarantine zine um, called connection unstable and in addition to some drawings and other kind of um just things happening on social media ways people articles ways people were processing that time to create this this kind of time capsule of what was happening in that moment not just how we were experiencing and documenting, but how others in our um, in our community um, were also navigating this time. And we released this zine um, mid-May and um, had some physical copies, but you can also just see it online right here. Um, and that we released the zine about a week before George Floyd was killed. So. What's really in, uh, intense for me now looking back through this project um, and especially, you know, the images here is that these are images of folks prior to that trauma, experiencing other traumas, of course, like just being isolated, but George Floyd hadn't been murdered yet. And so as I look back on this work, it is this kind of eerie, eerie um, look back at who we were before that event and then how Minneapolis changed afterwards, um, how I changed. I live just three blocks away from um, where he was murdered and the where the memorial is right now. So um, would I have made this work, you know, after Memorial Day? Um, I, I'm not sure, probably not, you know, so it ends up being this really interesting kind of um yeah capture of what my state of mind and what other state of minds were at that time and then my work dramatically shifted again um after that so yeah i think i'll just i think i'll end there oh it's very powerful <clears throat> leslie to really think about that snapshot of that moment before um how much our lives changed um so radically, um, and what it would have meant. I don't know, what, what do they look like now? What do those same people look like, right? Do we look different knowing what's happened and what's changed in our, in our immediate surroundings here and the way we're looking at everything? Um, yeah. And communicating really... through Zoom at that time was still so new. And so yeah. people, there was also like a, um, there's a lot of interest in it, right? And curiosity about like that particular method, whereas now it's so it's so mundane. It's just kind mm -hmm. of how we do. Um, so yeah, I would imagine they would be very different 
no yeah 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 um but i i do find people respond really well to your paintings when i do tours leslie i just want you to know that they're just they kind of gasp a little bit like oh i recognize this like to see it um commemorated or immortalized in painting kind of way that people respect oil <laughs> respect oil painting and right that they're like oh yeah you know that's that's my life you know and there's definitely a relatability for visitors um you know as we're getting so used to it but um i um i don't know it's just i i'm just really um Maybe, oh, that's what I wanted to mention is this quickly, Leslie, is that you did a lot of work in terms of murals and um, art on the streets um, in the days following George Floyd's murder. And just, I just want to mention that you also just did a lot of work in that, um, uh, you know, in the community afterwards and just recognize that for you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, my practice definitely took a, a like I said another dramatic shift um, after this. I mean, we all had plans for 2020, and uh, especially for the summer. I'm a teacher, so like um, when I'm not teaching at the U of M, I am like deep in my practice, and so it was so different. Like this summer, it was such a different um, experience. Um, I spent the majority of my time, yeah, on the streets organizing with people, young artists primarily, and we did lots and lots of murals. Um, I, my, I myself was a lead artist on nine of them, but we did over 50. Wow. Yeah. Well, just thank you for all your contribution in that. Yeah. Um, uh, all right, so I'm, I'm really excited to hear from Adam and Coco. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how you guys worked as a pair, especially when you were separated by vast, uh, vast uh, geographical di different distances. Um, Adams in London and Coco's in Huntsville, Alabama. And um, so I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Tell us more about Whole House Held. All right. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. Pleasure. Um, yeah, so this project started probably like the second week of lockdown um, in the South. Um, Adam and I know each other from the MA we did at London College of Communication. So I had just moved back to the US after being in Europe, Italy, and the UK um, for almost four years. <laughs> so there, yeah, there was kind of a need to be to reestablish connections anyways. Uh, and then lockdown happened and it was just like, oh my God, I'm completely disoriented. <laughs> uh, and so I'm a portrait photographer. I, I like working with people and um, I started photographing neighbors through windows and not just an attempt to connect through the pandemic, but just to like reestablish myself um, in this home that I hadn't lived in in quite some time and got Adam involved and it became this sort of, um, transatlantic exchange of sorts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, adding to that, um, first of all, thanks so much for the virtual, can you hear me? I'm not on mute or anything, am I? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, uh, yeah, thanks for the virtual tour of the exhibition. That was really wonderful to see and also hearing about Leslie's work as well. It's fantastic. Um, so adding to, yeah, what Coco was just saying. Um, I think kind of the projects that were like took form after Coco posted a portrait on Instagram, um, which I saw, which was of um, someone in Huntsville. Am I correct? Yeah. Um, in their window. Um, and at the time it was like, that's a really cool idea for a lockdown project as we were both going into lockdown. Um, and at the time it felt like very like original. Um, I've seen a few different projects now of, you know, people in doorways and windows and, but, um, yeah, so I reached out to Coco and basically, uh, begged her to allow me to be a part of that project. <laughs> um, and then we spoke a little bit more about these comfort papers. Um, and you know, this, 
I think something that we both um, maybe have learned or have had it drummed into us a little bit on the MA that we both studies is that photographs don't speak by themselves. Um, so having another component, um, an added layer of what these photographs and what these people in these photographs could say was important to us, um, which is then why we have these comfort papers which accompany each portrait. Yeah, we also, um, we chose to shoot the photos on medium format film as well, which ended up being a really important part of the process because it's really slow just by nature. You know, you have to stand there and load the camera and get everything perfect and you have a very limited amount of shots. Um, so just by the nature of the beast, it takes <laughs> quite a while to take a portrait, uh, especially with the camera we were using, which is a very large, heavy Mamiya. Um, so that sort of facilitated the conversations we had with people. Um, it took a lot of time, so we had to be really deliberate in what we were doing. Um, and it meant that, yeah, these kind of connections and conversations unfolded because, yeah, we, I think we, we needed it for one thing. This was March, April, May. Uh, but also we didn't really have a choice. You know, you're standing there with this camera trying to get things correct and in the viewfinder and yeah, it, it really was the most social interaction that I had. Um, I was living with family for a while, and then I stayed with a friend in Louisiana for a bit after as well, and, you know, saw one, two other people, um, just my household, plus the people in this project, and yeah, I think it was, for me at least, it was vital to my city, <laughs> having this sort of, this reason to stop and connect with people in a way that just wasn't wasn't possible in a day-to-day -day way anymore. I think what helped also um, make those conversations and those meetings and interactions with neighbours that we didn't previously know in a lot of cases um, much easier was that um, we had already um, asked for these representations of comfort on a piece of plain paper so that when we met we already had a starting point um, and you know it, I mean at the time when lockdown one started everything felt so novel and um, you know there was almost like an excitement to talk to people about you know what do you think is going to happen and um, you know how they were coping so far so it, I, I didn't find it difficult to you know, communicate and connect. Um, and maybe I'm someone who actually kind of just in sort of normal life, whatever that means. Um, you know, it's trying to feel like I'm always trying to keep up with the pace of living in London. Um, so, you know, having everyone pause for a moment was, I, I found it um, quite comforting in a way, quite selfishly. Um, yeah, and having like these big, so medium format cameras is always a talking point as well because you know you probably got on average we take sort of only sort of two or three frames um, of most most participants um, but probably spend at least 45 minutes an hour on average I'd say yeah. um, for me um, as well. actually talking to people um, which was really important in terms of connecting and yeah maintaining um, sanity and having something to do um, of comfort for ourselves. Absolutely. Yeah, um, and by the end of it, I just started knocking on neighbors' doors <laughs> and then like backing across the lawn when they'd answer the door and I'd like have my camera with me and be, hi, <laughs> I'm working on a project. Do you want to participate? Uh, found some people via social media. It just, it turned into this sort of like this hunt for <laughs> connection by the end of it which was pretty fun and gave a meaning to these these weird days that sort of blended into each other during the early pandemic um again before um things changed around may with um with george floyd and everything that's happened since you know it just i i don't know i really agree with leslie and that it felt it was i don't know i don't know if this project would exist in the same way prior to that either. Um, things have definitely become a lot heavier. Um, I think we're all 
really fatigued with the virus, with the state of politics right now. Um, yeah. Anyways. <laughs> yeah. No, I um, I I agree. Uh, it, um, but I I'm really enjoying your stories of your kind of your courage like to go out and just knock on strangers doors and just be like, Hey, you know, I'm doing this project. And <laughs> I think that's really beautiful. And um, I think what I'm hearing from all three of you is how much working on these individual projects um, really promoted your own sort of healing or your own way to pause and process and kind of contemplate what's changing and what's um, not or what whatever is going on. Um. Yeah, no, it, it um, provided that space for me on a lot of levels. Um, my personal favorite image of the ones that I made in the exhibitions of my parents. Um, and one thing that you wouldn't know just going through the exhibition um, or looking at the project is that it was actually the last photo that I have of them together. Um, they split up during the summer. <laughs> and so wow. this exhibition also offered, or the project really, offered a way for me to contextualize that within you know, this body of work. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's meaningful on a variety of levels for me. Um, I think it, yeah, it, mm -hmm. it gave me the space that I needed to process yeah. so much. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Crazy year for everybody. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm change lots of change right um wow um no it's really um, powerful um one thing i'm wondering um the the thing that i think is really similar with all of your work too is this kind of focus on the screen and not necessarily i mean with leslie it's the the computer screen that's between us and the people that um, we're looking at um, as a viewer, there's a kind of thing in the perspective of the viewer, but I also really love the way that the window, the way that you use the windows um, in your portraits and the ways the reflection on the windows is kept in a way. And then like, it just, um, I think it just really, to me, just then the word reflection just comes into the conversation when you're looking at them because I think that's what they're doing is like you're talking about reflection of that time the pause I think Adam mentioned like you can just pause and think what well what has brought me comfort or or whatnot so I don't know I just maybe you could talk about oh this is a great example of using that reflection you guys did is this yours Coco um I am actually not seeing uh Oh. This is one of mine. Can you? Oh, it is. Can you see my screen? Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah, no, that's one of Adam's. Okay. So I don't know just how you, um, I don't know, just maybe in both of you do it. Both you, uh, Coco and Adam, are using reflection in the way that you do the portraits. So. Sometimes it really doesn't work, by the way. You, know, like you, don't, you don't get to see um, the shots, which are just like, you know, burnt out white cloudy skies that mask people's faces completely. Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, could have been another route to take this project down, but, you know, it was more about representing people um, and seeing, you know, uh, seeing their faces and some emotions. Um, it's interesting that you actually picked this one out because it might be it's definitely one of my favorites um and it's of an old i really love it too yeah. thanks yeah it's of a um a, this is actually a friend of mine who i've known since i was 11 aisha and this particular pictures i know that it's um really special to them and it's now on their living room wall um because she was seven months pregnant um at oh. the time um, and so, you know, since this photograph's been taken, there's a little baby Aww. Amos in the world really as well. Um, mm. And the direction with the photo as well was, you know, asking them to think about, well, this time in a year, um, 
so much is going to have changed for you guys and for everyone, but um, what's it going to be like, you know, with the three of you? So I kind of hope that um, I managed to capture like a little bit of that sort of hope and fascination and intrigue. Yeah, I think the, the gaze upward, the way that they're looking is really like aspirational, hopeful, mm. you know, looking out into the distance together. Yeah, I yeah. feel you captured that. Really nice. Thanks. And I think like kind of um, for a lot of the photos as well, um, in terms of trying to find a feel and direction to try and take it away from COVID as well and to, mm -hmm. you know, allow people's imaginations to go in other places rather than, you know, we're representing this time, but, you know, it was also nice to try and like, so, you know, also talking to people about, you know, where do we go from here and, you know, comfort, hope, um, what are the possibilities beyond her? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I think that's really, and so much the aim of the whole exhibition, really, is to mm. capture that for our visitors at this time, or in the future, in a month's time, our visitors, I should say. Yeah. Um, how are we doing for time? Oh, I think we probably should break for questions from the audience um, because we have um, about 10 minutes left. Although I might just take one moment because the, I have to say, I think this is one of my favorites from you guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love this guy and I was like <laughs> adamant that he had to be in because he's just, I don't know. He, I just, I love this image and I love his comfort paper because yeah. it's on the Lake Charles Police Department <laughs> victim witness statement paper. <laughs> and that um, he's talking about intimacy and he's living alone and he's gaining intimacy with himself. <laughs> and I just, I just, I don't know. I, I, he just seems like a character in the best sort of way. I just I love it. So anyways, that's my little before we break for questions and whatnot. So I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Um, I see that there's um, a comment in the chat. So I'm just going to read that out to us. Um, there's privilege in being able to go into any neighborhood, let alone knock on doors and not have the police call. We don't all have that same lived experience. Thank there you. you. It shall be. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Really good point. Absolutely. Yep. Um, so uh, any other, any questions, comments, reflections from, uh, from our attendees? Arika has a question here. Coco and Adam, with the two locations in London and the South, I'm wondering if you feel like the two very different locations come through in the images. Mm. Were there regional themes that arose? And I pull back your, your, um, your Instagram so we can see that. I personally felt that um, the South and the US, you know, the US images, um, the facades of the houses and the exteriors were far more interesting. Um, so I felt quite envious. <laughs> um, but maybe it's just that, you know, that idea of the exotic and what you don't know, um, rather than what you're overly familiar with. But I really love the exteriors that Coco's captured. Yeah, I think, um, especially the time, so I started the project in Alabama um, and then ended up staying with a friend in Louisiana, some personal circumstances changed. Um, but along with that, the, the houses that I was photographing changed quite a lot. I think the images, really the only images that I can look at and say, you know, this looks like this place are the ones from Louisiana, just because the houses were very distinct. Um, but I do think, yeah, we, we talked a lot about, you know, do we wanna, <clears throat> say where these photos were made, uh, as we want to leave it in, um, ambiguous, and we ended up deciding, no, just kind of letting them, letting viewers decide for themselves. Um, but I think some of them are distinct, but most of them, yeah, they, they do sort of blend in a, in a weird sort of way, which, yeah, 
I don't know. Um, yeah, I feel like this one marks out as American. <laughs> That's Louisiana. <laughs> as, you know, I just have a, well, I also, I lived in Ireland for 10 years, so I, I can, I, I don't know, I think if you have some sensitivity to what things look like in England, but, um, but this feels so very American, like I'm not going to see that in England. Am I right, Adam, or? We don't have porches really out front. Yeah. <laughs> um, and also, I think any sort of wood panelled houses, um, mm -hmm. uh, for me, like, I, I don't see any of them in London. Lots of red bricks, though. Right. So we're going to guess this is England. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. 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 Maybe the cricket bat in the front say, there as well is also a good way. And the, the, and the soccer balls. <laughs> yeah. The football, soccer balls. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but in, in terms of Arika's question, is there kind of like an aesthetic or a theme that comes up based on place? If you felt that, or, cause I, I feel, I feel there's cohesion between your two places, but. Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't think that it wasn't deliberate <laughs> if, there, if there is a, a theme that comes through that kind of divides the two places. Um, no, it wasn't deliberate. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing so I can see these comments that are coming in. Um, oh, it's Amy saying that um, uh, just welcoming people to come through till January 17th. Sorry. So um, any other questions from our audience? Um, I wanted to bring up the fact that both of you or all three of you really are working in a series um, that you chose to work in a series that you're adding to on a very, um, I would say it seems like you're producing fairly, a fairly good amount in, in these series in a somewhat compact sense of time, right? Um, that it feels to me, and I think that um, commonly you look into Leslie and this idea of wanting something that you can accomplish quickly, that you can feel a sense of um, gratification for completing something and then like going on to the next one in the series. And, um, and the same with Arika has done a series and Peter Chazalski and this idea that the series is this way of maybe t marking time or um, some sort of um, thing that was made even more important during quarantine or during mm -hmm. our confinement and just wondering if you guys would talk about that process. Yeah, I like your description of it as like marking time because I feel like, yeah, I didn't notice that that we all had this series thing until you mentioned that, Sheila. And for me, it was more about creating like a container or some type mm -hmm. of structure when everything else felt like very unstructured and that there was no kind of timeline or end, right? Um, that having this like method or um, yeah, just structure to the work that you could follow a form mm -hmm. that you could follow so that, you know, if everything else was kind of in flux, you knew what was like pretty much what was required of like the process. Right. So for me, it's like, I didn't have to make very many decisions except for which screenshot to paint. And it really helped me just um, feel more like absorbed in the painting process and just the enjoyment of like applying the paint versus having to, yeah, think too much about composition or anything else, right? It was more about, yeah, this methodical like timed um, process. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense when maybe the day seems like really long and open and then you're like, okay, for two hours, I'm going to focus in and do this, this one thing. Yeah. yeah. 
I think um, for Coco and I, it could have there could have been a much more instant sense of um, probably not gratification because we both like shooting film. But if we were shooting digitally, then the series could also be bigger. It could contain you know far more photographs. But that really wasn't the point. Um, and also shooting film in this way where it is very slow. It kept me busy during this time where there wasn't too much more to do in that I also learned how to develop color film at home, um, which takes, you know, like a considerable amount of time by the time you've, you know, like unloaded a camera and then finally have your film hanging out to dry and then digitizing that as well to share on Instagram and social media. Um, so it really kind of gave me some structure and routine that was um, very important at the time. How about you, Coco? Um, yeah, gosh, I'm just... <sighs> Same thing. I, I think I needed the, the structure and routine. Um, I also just felt good to feel like I was working on something. I, um, I don't know, I'm, I've always been a very project goal oriented person, especially in my artistic practice. Um, and I have a hard time just like, I think this also might come from <laughs> the MA we did as well, but um, working in like single images isn't as exciting to me. Mm. I like feeling like I'm building something, you know? And during the early days of quarantine, you know, it just, that sense of, <sighs> productivity, which is honestly kind of a, I don't, I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing. But, you know, my, my sense of purpose is um, tied to my productivity. That's actually something that I'm trying to get away from in some way. Uh, and I think that also is a lot of us having to work from home uh, or finding ourselves out of work um, in many cases. Um, I, I lost my job at the beginning of the pandemic and it was quite a blow. Uh, I'm very, very, very fortunate to have had, you know, a support system in that. I know many people don't, but, um, yeah, that sense of, like, I'm making something, <laughs> uh, I'm building something, you know, even if it's, it's a series of photographs, um, gave me, yeah, I don't know, a sense of purpose, you know, in a way, um, because it's, yeah sitting with yourself without that sort of structure when you're so used to it uh, is hard. It, it really is. Yeah, I, I, I think I heard that from every artist who's in this exhibition, really. Um, you know, uh, from, uh, definitely from both Peter and Erika, you know, uh, but you're right when we're so product driven in our identities and needing to accomplish things, it's just like, yeah, this one thing that you do. But I think too, with because, um, well, the reason I brought you three together for conversation is really because you're focusing in on the portrait. And, and I think what I see too with this series um, is the conversation, right? There's this conversation be between you and the sitter as the artist and the sitter, but there's also then the conversation because you've done multiples amongst all of the sitters, right? That they're there really adds up to this idea that we are not alone in this, that we're all experiencing this together, even though we are apart. And I know I sound now like a public service announcement, <laughs> but it is kind of, it. we need that reiterated and said over and over, we need to feel that because we are feeling so isolated and alone, um, that then to see this over and over again was, I, I think, uh, one of the more meaningful parts of the exhibition is those conversations created between the portraits and everything. Um, so we're coming on after one and it's hard to believe. Uh, I feel like uh, I'm, I've learned so much, uh, even, even though I'm very familiar with your work, uh, hearing you talk about it. Um, any last comments or questions for the artists before we conclude? Um, okay, so uh, stay tuned for the next one. I guess I had, I said December 6th, I'm sorry, it is December 10th with Benedetta Manfriani and Zoe Sinell. Uh, we'll be in conversation uh, for the last of the Creative Confinement Artist Talks. 
please come visit when you can after December 18th. Uh, hopefully we'll be re able to reopen. Um, and again, there's uh, images on our website. Uh, follow these artists on Instagram and follow what they're doing now. Um, and thank you so much to Adam, Coco, and Leslie for being here today. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. Right. Thank okay. you. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Bye now.